Welcome to the Gnostic Warrior. How are you doing today, Monty? Okay, very well, thanks. Awesome. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, you're actually from one of the favorite bands of mine of all time called The Damned. And it's nice to circle back to you on your path of Gnosticism. And you have a new book out as, as well. But before we get into all that great work, what I'd like you to do is tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up in Cambridge and then, you know, going through to your profession and then also a little bit about music and your path to Gnosis. Okay, well, um, yeah, I was born in Cambridge, although we moved, we moved to a place called Norwich in uh, 1968. And it was there in Norwich side that I had a series of uh, visions. I kept having strange hallucinations every night for a while. And um, in particular, there was this uh, dark, formless thing that kept emerging in my room at night. And I, I felt that it would absorb me. And if I, if I used to call out for my parents to help me with that. And, uh, but I'd see other things as well and other things that didn't disturb me so much. I, sometimes I'd see things and they look more like cartoons than, than natural, real things. And uh, I'd think of a soldier and I saw a soldier and then I thought of an, a witch and I saw a witch flying a broomstick and I thought, hang on a minute, this is all in here somewhere. You know, the, the, it was quite weird. And uh, the, this is 1968. So, you know, there's a lot of people uh, doing similar things with, with chemicals, but I was a kid, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> unless, my, unless my uncle was doing secret experiments on me and I didn't know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> presumably they were a natural phenomenon. But anyway, I kind of realized that they were in my mind. And so I thought, well, that the thing must also be in my mind. It can't be a natural real entity. And uh, maybe I was perhaps influenced by an early Doctor Who program where they had to deny the uh, reality of the things, that, the scary things that they were seeing. So it's not real, it's not real, and it would vanish. Uh, a little bit like in, uh, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where you're saying, uh, oh, you of noble birth, do not believe what you're seeing. These are, uh, are not, these are parts of your mind. You must, you know, of, uh, as you're going through the death, to the transition. So I, I faced the thing and uh, it went, it sort of pulsated a bit and then it went back where it came from. And I knew it was never going to, I was never going to see it again. And I guess that, gave me a sort of interest in, in the mind and uh, in, uh, later in psychiatry, later on when I first experienced um, meeting with, with a woman who'd had a breakdown, she came into a, the workplace I was in at the time and she said, I've got to a quarter to ten to save the universe and you should smash all these computers, they're evil. And then she went off and I thought, well, what's this happening? What's going on? So uh, I, I had to go and visit her in the hospital and when I heard she'd been bitted there. And so I, went, I used to go regularly and uh, until she, she came back to normality or what that, whatever that is. And uh, I got interested in psychiatry through that. And I suppose I've always had that interest in, pe in the subjective element of people's experience. Uh, I got very interested in the psychotherapy and psychoanalysis of psycho psychosis rather than just in neur neurosis. I was always interested in trying to understand what would it be like to be someone who has these experiences, who has these thoughts, who believes these things, because often I feel as if it's very isolating for those people. And it was at the same time when I was doing my nurse training that I discovered Jung and I got really into Jung and it was Jung who led me there to the Gnostics. And obviously the Gnostics again is very much an important aspect of your subjective experience, your own spiritual experience of things of light and dark and visions and, and all kinds of things. And that, that really interested me as an alternative to, to, the, to the very rigid dogmatic kind of belief systems that I'd uh, kind of been used to. Uh, but it, I suppose music, uh, that again goes back to, to the same, same period where, uh, although we'd moved to Norwich, we were still in contact with my grandparents and my uncle in Cambridge. And my own Cambridge, and in Cambridge, my uncle had a pirate radio show. He built his own transmitter and he was playing all this stuff. And he was playing me Pink Floyd and 
uh, Jimi Hendrix and Captain Beefheart and all this psychedelic music when I was really young. And uh, that had a big impression. He had his own light show as well. He used to do light shows for bands. And it was like a real, it was a real clash, you know, his culture with compared to the culture of my of my grandparents. My parents were more kind of malleable. They were kind of finding their own way at that time, I think. But, but certainly my grandparents were, were quite old fashioned in many ways. And he suddenly had this world of different smells, different sounds, different colours, you know, really interesting. Uh, so that, that sort of got me interested in, in sounds in particular, because my uncle built his own uh, effects unit, he had a delay uh, unit. And I, he said, oh, you entertain yourself with that for half an hour. I, I, you know, stop annoying me. So if I put the headphones <laughs> on, I can make, make all these noises with my voice into the uh, microphone. It would all echo. Was, oh, this is good. I like this. <laughs> So that was your first experience with an instrument? Well, no, I was um, I was learning piano as well, and I used to improvise on the piano too uh, then. But I had, I suppose, that there was that mixture of, you know, the more playing more straight on the piano and uh, and experimenting with with sounds. Uh, later, the two things come together more, but. Uh, but back then, but I did used to play the piano for hours on end, just just improvising. I always loved improvising. Uh, I later found out my grandmother used to play for the silent movies, so that kind of fitted, you know, with 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 what she'd been doing. I was, which I much preferred that idea to struggling to learn music, reading music, which I found very difficult because I think I had musical dyslexia or something. So you just learned by by sound and and doing it yourself, self taught. Yeah, a lot of it. Yes. Yeah. So mixture. I did have the lessons and I improvised on my own as well. But later I uh, I was experiment. I was learning to to drum. You know, I didn't have a kit at that time. I was drumming on anything that made a noise. And uh, I taught myself a bit of guitar as well. And that was the time coming up to the punk uh, time when I think before that you felt a bit daunted by the big bands, you know, Pink Floyd and everything, over all the equipment they had, and all obviously they had money to buy the equipment. They didn't have. <laughs> and sure. Kept, during the punk era, it was more no, no, just do it yourself with whatever you've got, you know. Uh, yeah. And so that that liberated uh, the creativity more, and uh, started sort of writing songs and stuff like that then. Yeah, I mean that that was the the counterculture movement and the DIY, you know, do it yourself, you know, which I was um, a big part of here in Southern California, and you were in the UK um, a, a decade earlier or, or more than me, you know, and you had all these influences, and of course back then we didn't have uh, we had the video games, the the big ones that were my generation, right, where you had to go to the arcade, but we didn't have the smartphones and all these distractions that. You know, we were almost forced to do it ourselves and, and to be creative to make our way. And that's I, what I believe um, attracted a lot of us, I, I feel, to the counterculture movements and to, you know, music like like punk rock. Uh, when did you first get into the, the punk movement? Of course, you were into music earlier. You had mentioned Jimi Hendrix and um, Pink Floyd, all these big bands, like you had said, that had, you know, these 10, 15 minute songs and, you know, these big orchestras and so forth and then here you are um what was your first um influences after that in punk rock well i suppose it all it all goes back to the dj john peel in britain i was listening to john peel religiously pretty you know, every night he was broadcasting and um even before punk came out, i was listening to him then so i discovered bands like gong i heard gong for the first time on john peel just heard this really crazy psychedelic noises, and strange, strange lyrics and things. I thought, oh, wow, I like this. But that was before, you know, and then obviously the punk explosion came in 1976. Uh, when he, and, and yeah, indeed, the Danbury were the, were the first band I remember hearing of, of that. Uh, them and the Stranglers, I think it was those were the two. And then there was this huge explosion of, of bands who, some who just came and went who did like one single or two singles are really interesting. You know, some of them were really good, and, but always had that home homemade sort of feel to it. And I did have to adjust, you know, I had to adjust my uh, aesthetic a bit because 
obviously pr being brought up on the psychedelic and prog stuff, I suddenly had to go back to a more pared down primitive, uh, you know, real hardcore rock and roll aesthetic, which was obviously different. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it at first. I thought, blimey, what's this? You know, I don't know if I like it or not. But, you know, in a week or two, it's, yeah, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? It's good. Yeah. <laughs> And also at that time, the prog bands were starting to get slower and stodgier and have less interesting ideas in general. Uh, so, so it, and, and it was such a good alternative to the disco and, and also the, the, that sort of country rock stuff, which we used to, we used to call it bland rock. There was, a lot, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of that about, and I thought, oh God, this is tedious. And <laughs> so yeah, punk was a really exciting thing at that time, but not, not just, just the punk stuff. I mean, there was also bands who weren't, who were connected with that, you know, that kind of new wave thing who were doing sure. different things, uh, people like The Normal and uh, The Residents and, you know, all different people doing different things. It, it was interesting. It was uh, before punk became a bit, it did, after a while, it did get a bit kind of formalised, a bit left right, perhaps. <laughs> uh, became a bit sort yeah. of... And, the, uh, yeah, and then yeah. that got divided yeah. into various categories, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we were all punks fighting punks over the type of music we liked, right? Or how we dressed. <laughs> but, but back then, I mean, I, I, there was definitely an antagonism to the older music. You know, they said that the uh, they, people from the older bands, the psychedelic and broad bands, were all old farts and all this. And that wasn't yeah. true. No, um, I, I agree. People like... People like David Allen of Gong, who they did play this with here and now. They did this really quite punky psych psychedelic punk music. And of course, later when I got to know Captain, uh, I, I knew that you know he loved Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd, and he loved uh, Canterbury, the Canterbury uh, prog scene and and stuff like that. And I heard from other people, people like the Dickies, they'd like to talk about prog rock. And, oh. <laughs> Uh, when we got met them and uh, 999 and so on, you know, all these people, they did like this stuff as well. So, but I guess it was the way it was sold in the media. No, this is the new thing. You know, it's like futurism, I suppose, in, in the the Italian futurists. They say, all oh, the past is rubbish. This is now, you know, uh, sure. this is, is the noise we have now and uh, so on. Well, I, I think to be yeah. like that for a little while. Well, as, as a punk, it, it was like I forged my own path and that was the idea was I wasn't going to go along with the crowd. So I got turned on to the traditional punk rock um, when I was younger, fortunately by my sister's boyfriend who turned me on to The Damned and to all the bands you had mentioned. I, I know you had mentioned, um, who was it? Um, the Dickies and 999. I remember seeing The Damned, The Dickies, 999 and The Circle Jerks together yeah. and I think it was maybe the adolescence as well nice. here in Southern California one of my um, favorite all-time concerts that I ever went to in the the late 80s um, or mid 80s I believe it was um, but yeah it's uh, it's interesting though I, I believe that you know we started dividing and all this different music and these cultures had kind of made it to where punk rockers started clashing against one another and then of course there was people that just remain true to themselves, you know? So what I also find interesting is that one of the first bands that you listen to, one of the first punk bands of all time, The Damned, and then a decade or two later, you're playing for them. I mean, was that like a kind of a dream come true? Did you did you visualize that at all? Tell us about that. Yeah, I did. It, uh, it was when, uh, when Strawberries came out, the album Strawberries. I was listening to that and there was a lot of organ playing on it. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, they, they played a lot of keyboards. God, I wish I could have a chance to play with these guys, you know. <laughs> I really oh, that's did. That's cool. You know? And uh, so, yeah, as they say, be careful what you wish. <laughs> 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 uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, it was indeed a dream come true. And, uh, and it, was, it was easy for me, well, relatively easy, to learn the songs because I was so familiar with them. You know, I hadn't learned to play them before. I didn't usually learn to play other people's songs. I, I'd rather I'd try and create stuff of my own that sounded like people that I, that I liked. But, uh, but yeah, I was so familiar with the songs that it, uh, it helped a lot. That's awesome. Tell us about uh, how did that happen? Did, was there an ad in the paper? What, what, what happened? Oh, so it's all a bit complex. It, uh, well, it starts out really, it's all down to Captain Sensible. And it starts out that with him moving to Brighton, 
uh, and um, but it, it's also <laughs> also a bit due to Kate Bush as well because I, I I'd started releasing my songs on a, a underground cassette label called Acid Tapes. This was in the in, in the mid eighties. And I sent her one of these and uh, through her fan club because I was a fan of Kate Bush, and she um, still had of course. And she uh, sent back a, a letter, you know, which was really really nice. And she encouraged, oh, I think you should play live. And at that time, I thought, oh gosh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I didn't I didn't have a band or anything. How do I do that? And uh, then this place opened up in Brighton called the Zap Club. And the Zap Club was like, it was like the Cabaret Voltaire of Brighton. It was a it's anything goes kind of uh, kind of venue, very much alternative cabaret. There was a strong alternative cabaret movement going on just before the rave scene exploded. Uh, so so uh, there was a platform night on Tuesdays. So I thought, oh, perfect. I can try stuff out there. And I can try what Kate Bush suggested. And it was there that I uh, met Cap. Captain Sensible, he was in the audience checking out because he was always interested in what was going on, who was, you know, who was doing what. And uh, I, I think he likes quite a bit of weirdness as well. <laughs> so there are plenty of weird characters, including a friend of mine uh, I got to know there who called himself Captain Stupid. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it ended up that Captain Stupid and I went round to Captain Sensible's house and did uh, did some recordings. All this stuff is on um, on my um, Bandcamp now. I've released it on the Bandcamp, so you can check that out. Oh, cool. But uh, it was just amazing. I was like, wow, I'm I'm in Captain Sensible's house. So, you know, I was really uh, <laughs> dumbstruck and oh, wow, I'd really like to play with this guy, you know. But it didn't happen till years later um, until because. I have to explain that Captain wasn't in the Damned at this time. This was the the mid '80s, so he was having his solo career, and he he was struggling a bit at the time as well. The the glory days had gone by a bit, and he was just struggling to keep going. Uh, went through some very difficult times, um, and so the Damned was you know they weren't on the horizon. They were doing their own thing. They were you know doing Eloise and all that stuff. So so what happened next? Oh yes. <laughs> so I joined after playing with Captain in the Doctor Space Toad experience, <laughs> which was as a result of a, another crazy scene in Brighton called Club Space Toad in a pub called the Albert. Um, I ended up first of all I was playing drums for them actually until the drum kit fell apart. It was my uncle's old drum kit, and uh, he left me, and it was getting quite old. And <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'll play keyboards, and we've got other drummers and. And then Captain said, oh, I want to play my solo stuff again. So will you join uh, my band? He was calling it the Punk Floyd at the time. So I joined uh, the Punk Floyd and we went on tour. And uh, the, the tour was supposed to be uh, alongside the uh, Phantom Chords, which was uh, Dave Vanian's solo project at the time. But for some reason, things weren't going well. And there was only one gig in London uh, where uh, the Phantom Chords appeared and Dave and Captain got talking to one another. He thought, oh, there's something going on there. I don't know, you know. But it turned out that Dave was getting tired of the lineup that, uh, of the dam that, that, that there was. And they said, said well, let's form another one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Captain brought me along with him. And I can't, I can't even remember uh, being told this. You know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just so crazy. I just couldn't believe it. But there I was in a rehearsal studio, learned playing these songs. I was so, so familiar with with uh, with Captain uh, and Paul Gray and Dave and and the guy called Gary Dreadful, who was who was, who was um, Captain's drummer at the time. And uh, yeah, and that's how it all started in uh, 1996. And uh, been in it 25 years now. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a great story. Yeah, and, and when you analyze the, the punk rock movement and the counterculture movement, what do you feel like as a psychiatrist? Do you feel that we were like rebelling against the world and, and society and you know we all kind of magnetized towards one another, all us rebellious youth, whether that be you know boys or, or girls, men, women, and so forth, and getting into this music where it was dangerous you know, it was dangerous to be a punk rocker to go to these shows sometimes and violence would happen. But 
it was sometimes exciting, you know, to just be around this and be a part of this movement. And then, of course, I started my own garage bands, never nothing close to anything like um, you guys have, have ever done. But, you know, what do you feel as a psychiatrist looking back, analyzing it, and, and what do you feel? Well, I suppose it all this stuff, I, I would trace it back actually to the to the jazz of the uh, the late 50s, you know, in particular when it became more and more, you know, there was people like Mingus and that, they're, they're getting more and more out there until it became the free, the free improv, really, you know, really crazy free improv jazz. You pre rock, really pre rock and roll yeah, things, right? Yeah. You, you can't really have a freer type of music than free improv, you know, you're just doing it in the moment. There's no chords, there's no timing, there's no nothing, you just do, you know. And I'm still involved in, in that today. We have a thing called the Safe House Collective where you pick names out of a hat and just play together. So you've got no key, you've got no no song, nothing. You just do it and create it. Just start jamming. And yeah, this cool. sort of, that development started, was going along with the beat generation. So there was a lot of the poets of the beat generation. A lot of them were, were also experimenting with spiritual ideas. So people like Allen Ginsberg and uh, so on, they were getting interested in Buddhism and in the East. And, and that, of course, uh, mushroomed out during the 60s. A lot of people going out to the East uh, or the Middle East or anywhere to look for anything <laughs> that might be inspired them, as well as exploring their own spiritual stuff through, through partly through drugs or through meditation, or through both, uh, and, and putting that into creativity. And I guess so that gets filtered down into the the punk into the punk age i guess it's what happened was that the affluence that there was before during the 50s and 60s was starting to die away and life was getting much more tough and a lot of the ideals of the of the 60s generation were not you know it seemed like they weren't happening and they were fading away or else they had they had kind of um uh, become degenerate and and, and just people just making money out of music it wasn't didn't have the passion anymore so the punk was you know sort of like the, the i suppose it is it, i don't like to say it's like the death throes of it but it is almost like that there's like ah, i just gotta do something you know just <laughs> you know make yourself heard don't your voice heard always standing against the, the you know the sort of archontic authorities uh, that seem to control everything. I mean, the Thatchery, uh, you know, it just, <laughs> it just, uh, it was, I was unemployed for a long time during the Thatcher era. And uh, it just, you just felt uh, that you just had to sort of rebel against that stuff because it just wasn't right. It wasn't, it wasn't connected. It had no, com no compassion in it. And I suppose that's where, you know, the psychiatry part of me comes in. I'm very interested in, in empathy and compassion and understanding other people using a heart and, and gut mind as well as the head mind uh, in, in, all, in relating to people and just doing things, you know, it really helps, I think. Yeah, what I find interesting, and as I had mentioned earlier, how we all gravitated towards kind of the umbrella of, say, punk and, you know, some guys went into, say, heavy metal scene or whatever that was shortly thereafter that was kind of a a fraction off of the hardcore punk rock scene. And then it, it kind of fractioned into so many different movements within the punk scene. You had the hardcore, you had um, you had the skinheads, you had um, the Southern California punk rock scene. And just like you would go to these concerts and then they would turn into a lot of violence and fighting amongst different punk factions. I don't know, was it like that in the UK? Is It was like that here in Southern California. I think in... I think you kind of knew to avoid certain gigs. <laughs> sure, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> by the like bands a, that were playing, right? Yeah, like the, the <laughs> sure. Cockney rejects. Oh, I don't think I'll go to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but Pinch told me uh, he, he's a bit of an authority on this because he went. He, he Pinch was the drummer of the band until recently, uh, and he played in a band called English Dogs, and a lot of sure. a lot of those people used to be uh, attracted to that. Oh, English Dogs. Uh, um, but he said all that came to an end when the drugs changed. You know, as soon as they stopped taking uh, sp speed and and uh, and that Heroin, and, and yeah. had, uh, uh, ecstasy, then everybody was hugging each other and there was no more blood on the dance floor. You know, so, uh, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was wondering what what do you feel had happened? Um, you know, like we were given this this independent voice and and where we exercised it as punk rockers and we wanted to be heard and and we were angry and it was do it yourself. And at the same time, we found this coalition where we were magnetized to it. Then in the end, though, it was like uh, we kind of started fighting amongst one another's and then we didn't give honor to our ancestors in the business like the damned. And, you know, that's where like Captain Sensible couldn't make a living, you know, and he had some hard times where he should have been, you know, supported by the by the movement, you know, but it, it gets selfish and we, we want to move on and move on. What do you feel? Is that just selfishness of human behavior? Um, what do you what do you feel? Is that people not treating people how they they want to be treated? Um, as you had mentioned, kind of that heart kind of connect thing, and um, you know, there's a lot of violence and a lot of um, I would say left brain kind of thinking in, in punk rock. Yeah, I suppose uh, <laughs> maybe it's um, because if you know, you've, like, you've, you've got the energy and you, you've got the the anger and so on, but maybe it's a question of where to direct it, because if if it feels uh, futile to try and direct it against uh, the system, then where is it going to go? You know, <laughs> it kind of has to go somewhere. And uh, perhaps that, makes that sense. is, yeah, I mean, that I suppose you could say is a very gut, uh, the very gut response, a very gut way of thinking. So, yeah, got to do something, got to do something. <laughs> you know. Sure. Um, yeah, and if we think about where, you know, anger comes from, I know when I get mad, you know, and I, it, it always comes from the gut, you know, if I see a fight, the first thing I feel is, is my gut, you know, it's the sinking feeling or if violence is going down or something bad, um, you know, you have this gut reaction to, to that. So that, that's interesting. And I've been studying that as, as well lately, that the second brain and how the emotions and these various um, chemicals are actually operated through your your second brain, which is your GI tract, and it's modulated, I believe, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, or, and what you think um, by your research is that it's modulated, of course, by our, our mind and then also by our hearts if we're to kind of connect um, with that. And so, um, again, a lot of people don't understand that. Um, it is an angry type of movement. A lot of it is, is violence. Um, I was always attracted, you know, more towards, I feel, intellectual punk rock bands that had a message or I was never really turned on by the black flag six pack, you know, <laughs> it just wasn't really me. You know, I, I, of course, English dogs, I've heard them. They were OK. You know, I liked them once in a while, you know, when I was in kind of that mood, you know, um, we could say or even the Cockney Rejects, they had some good songs. But you're right. You don't want to go to a concert. Um, usually, and, and go into the skinhead pit, you know? Luckily, I always had short hair, so I would get a free pass. <laughs> but, you know, I had a friend actually with hair like yours at a, at a concert that um, happened to, I think it was Sham 69 and some other bands, but there was a skinhead band, and uh, we were in the pit and not knowing it was a skinhead pit, and they ended up beating him to a pulp because of his hair, you know? You know, just kind of singling him out, you know? But, um... That, that, was reminds, kind of... that reminds me of a story um, David Allen told me, David Allen of Gong, um, about Bob Geldof, you know, Mr. Mr. Peace and Love, but Bob, Bob Geldof was, they were at a gig of his, uh, I guess it was the Boomtown Rats at some point, and uh, they, he spotted them from off the stage, he said, look, hippies! kill them and they had to run away <laughs> as all these <laughs> other punks are coming after them, beat them up. What the, hell, what the hell's that about? You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. Sure, and and I, again, we're young men and women there, but you know, knuckleheads too. And when you get a group of any type of men together or whatever, there's going to be knuckleheads and people that are going to cause violence and do things and so forth. So I guess that's just part of the course when you you, you get a bunch of young men together. You know, when um. When did you get into psychiatry as far as, um, you know, going into school and, and studying and so forth? Oh, gosh, hang on. Uh, so so I left school and I went to initially to art college to in a place called Eastbourne. How old were you? Uh, oh, uh, I'm not sure. This is 1980. Okay. I was born in 61. So, so 21 years old. Uh, yeah. Or, so, or 19 years old. I'm sorry, 19, yeah. 19, my bad. 
So I went there and uh, that, that didn't really work out for me in terms of direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do with art, but it did. I did meet up with a good friend there called Alistair and we turned the whole thing into a, a crazy uh, jam session. We, we, we had, he had his boom, boom box in there and we were recording with toy instruments and screaming and freaking out, playing all these paint pots and everything. Uh, made an album out of that, which isn't on my band camp yet. I have to put that on there. <laughs> that will mm-hmm. uh, confuse some people. Uh, <laughs> So, so that I was only there a year, and then I was unemployed for a long time during the Thatcher period, and I read a lot during the Thatcher period. I was sort of uh, reading I had a lot of time. So then, yeah. So then it was eighty, yeah, eighty four, nineteen eighty four. Yes, the, that year that I had the, that experience with the woman. We, we were on a project to get us off the dole, uh, basically. Uh, involving computers, we were trying to develop software for uh, people with special, well, kids with special needs actually to learn. And they were far too primitive back then. These early Apple, they couldn't do much with them. The, the graphics were rubbish and the music was terrible. And <laughs> But we tried. <laughs> but anyway, it was there on that project that the, the woman came in and, uh, and uh, said, you know, I had to call to tend to save the universe. So it was after that I did my training. I did my three-year training uh, in Gradingwell and Chichester, and then qualified. And uh, yeah, and that that was that. Great. And and how are you still practicing right now as a psychiatrist? A psychiatric nurse. Yes, I still am. I'm uh, I'm uh, working now with the elderly. Uh, so it's mostly people with dementia, mostly. Um, but I, and I find that, I mean, that can be tremendously rewarding as well because uh, people with dementia suddenly find themselves in a world that doesn't make sense. So it's, it's similar to psychosis. It is quite psychotic in its way. So understanding what it's like to, to be disconnected from time or even to be living in the past, trying to make sense of the present using uh ideas from the past. I got very interested in all, in all of that uh, and teaching these ideas last year during the when we couldn't play any music. Um, I was getting involved in teaching classes at, at uh, the nursing home I work in, as well as what we call person-centered care. So re- care that really uh, takes the idea of the individual. Again, it's a little bit like, you know, punk is the person as an individual, the person as they want to be known or wanted to be known, you know, trying to adjust the care to that, get as far away from institutional care as possible. Uh, So, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still doing that. I've been working on care plans most recently. So, so working these, these plans that people can read and they can understand who this person is, what their strengths are, not just their, you know, what they can't do, um, trying to bring out their strengths in the same way as somebody projects themselves on social media. You know, they don't go on social media and say, oh, hi, I've, I've got dementia and I, I, I'm in content, I can't remember things. You know, they put, I'm this person, I can do this and I can do that and this is what interests me. So I'm trying to bring in the, the positive side of the person and make it really, uh, really stand out when you when a person, when, you know, when a carer reads the care plan, they go, oh, right, this is who this person is. This is how they would like to be treated. Um, you know, hopefully that, that will work that way. Well, yeah, I mean, what we think about, we talk about, we create in our lives, you know, so I would think if you do that, even if you have an illness and, and we could say dementia is that you kind of could self-fulfill that prophecy and maybe make it come on quicker. If you're always talking about it, I got dementia and I'm going to lose my mind and I might get Alzheimer's. You're, you're a self-fulfilling prophecy possibly. And, and again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, have you seen any, any benefits with this neuro it's neuro linguistic programming kind of in a way where you're telling them to think a certain way not not like forcing them mind control but like coaching them like hey let's let's do it this way and and that's the individual rather than they're this they're the illness right kind of thing well yes i think sure. what you're talking i think what you're talking about there would be reframing 
isn't it? It's yes. To, to put it in a different a different picture so that you Correct. can look at it differently. Uh, yeah, that is important because um, there's a relationship between severe depression and uh, and uh, dementia as well. So, I mean, if somebody is becoming becoming depressed, it, it it reduces their interest in life, reduces their responses, and that. So, obviously, that can as you're getting older. Uh, yeah, you want to you want to keep your interest alive. You want to keep uh, as many you know keep a broader focus as possible. Keep learning new things, listening to new music, doing different things. You know that will help to to keep dementia at bay. That's cool. Uh, but, so you, that those are some things that someone who's starting to lose their memory with dementia they they could start doing. Focus on themselves, the you know rather than the illness, and then also relearning new stuff. You're finding right. that helps keep it. Okay, cool. That's right, as well as um, you know, looking at diet and all of that, and exercise and all of that kind of thing, as well. So but they yeah, could. The, and Alzheimer's is essentially. Sorry to interrupt you. Is right, the next yeah. phase after dementia where they essentially, they're they're basically there's no hope of them possibly coming back, right? Where they they don't remember much. Every day is a struggle, or every memory possibly, right? Is is that usually the next phase after dementia? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, the way okay. uh, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. So you, you can have a, a number of different sorts of dementia. And Alzheimer's is one, the most common one, I guess, and the one that's most mysterious. Nobody really knows yet why it happens. Uh, whereas the vascular dementia is to do with the blood vessels in the brain, you know, getting blocked or damaged or, or as a result of a stroke. So, I mean, anyone, that can happen to anyone, you know. So you've got the vascular, you've got the, the Alzheimer's, and there's another one called Lewy body, body dementia, which in which people have hallucinations or can do. And then frontal temporal dementia, which is to do with the, the uh, parts of the brain that control emotions. Uh, so again, I suppose you're getting back to the to the violent mosh pit. Uh, the person who can't control <laughs> can't yeah. can't control their uh, urges well, that's... To, to hit people and stuff uh, comes there. <laughs> yeah. What What's interesting too is you say the emotions, and we talked about the the second brain. Um, you know, I, I did some research on dementia and Alzheimer's um, inadvertently um, re related to mold and so forth, and I'm finding that. 100% of biopsied, um, you know, people that have had their brains autopsied and so forth that had Alzheimer's, they're finding uh, mold, toxic mold, which of course, fungi, right, in their brains. And, and then also I'm finding that is a, a big issue in psychosis with people that take meth, they have fungal overgrowth and drugs. Um, so a lot of the psychosis, again, I, I'm not an expert, but what I'm learning, it's not essentially just the drug because someone could do a drug and not become psychotic, but over time it produces a medical condition within the person that is causing that psychosis to, to happen. And I, um, I contend that this same thing happens even when people don't do drugs, maybe it's through the food or, or through their homes and the environment where possibly this fungus is growing within them. And when I think about, you know, losing my mind and my memories, I think about when I drink um, alcohol, for example, which you're drinking moldy grains or, or hops or, or right. And um, you could temporarily get dementia temporarily, right? And you can, and you're, permanent, you can permanently, that's another form of and, and permanent alcohol related uh, brain. Uh, yeah. Where's the wood? <laughs> um, <laughs> But, sure. Oh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know about them. I hadn't heard about the mold. I mean, there are a lot of different theories, and there's a lot of research going on. I mean, the yeah. mold one makes me think. I'm glad we sorted this place out for because uh, we used to get a lot of bloody black mold uh, on the walls of the the <laughs> of your house uh, there, huh? Yeah, it's it's very prevalent in our in our homes, and it actually it brings me back to your story when you were a kid, um, and actually haunted houses and. Uh, psychosis and paranormal things in houses has also been tied to mold, you know, and um, they they have they're a living entity. Um, they they do have a type of brain and they seek to absorb um, things as well. And it's interesting that, you know, that story when you told it, you were like, hey, I was in this house and I was um, in my room and there was this black thing. Yes, I would think of these thoughts, which sounds 
great thought forms. You were creating these thought forms, but also there was this other entity that didn't seem like a thought form, but was a was a something that had energy. And you basically said, you know, with your own mind, we're more powerful than it, you know. And I, I believe that that is something that we do somehow. Um, and we interact with this mold. It seeks to absorb us when when it's in our house. Because I'm I'm a mold inspector and a mold remediator, just so oh. you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm not trying to sell, but I, I got into it because my son got sick from mold, um, and he had paranormal visions, uh, Monty. And um, yeah, at that time, ergot, isn't it? Ergot is that's a correct. Yeah, yeah. So so the theory there with ergot, um, which is, of course is the precursor to LSD, was like here in. Um, the Salem witch trials, which were here in um, the, the US, those were the results of people eating moldy ergot and they had these hallucinations yeah. and then they were accused of being witches and so forth. And then that you could tie actually back to the, the Delphi um, oracles and the forums where they used to they used to get the women and the virgin priestesses in, in Greece and Delphi and they would go over this pit of rotting stuff they wouldn't say it because it was a secret you know uh plutarch aristotle they were all initiates into these mysteries but um the various theories are it was ergot it was this and that but they would essentially they would have these fumes come up into their you know their orifices and and they would get these hallucinations and they would prophecy and that's where they got the oracle of delphi um so they would rely the secret society on these oracles that were uh, as a based on these hallucinations that that had happened. So um, long story short, going back to my son, he had like you, but terrible visions of hell and being dr and I, I never showed him horror movies or things because I knew that type of stuff could program him. And he was literally describing, you know, horror movies and being dragged to hell, just like kind of the 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 religious type of stuff. And he had them daily, um, day visions. He was losing his sight. Um, it ended up being toxic mold in our home, and it took about four to five years to bring him back to um, health again, which required hyperbaric oxygen and various things. But he eventually, as he got his health back, his mind restored, and he no longer had the, he, he slept walk uh, a walk, lot. Um, he would sleepwalk. I'd have to stay up. So all these different things got me interested in the mind and then, um, of course, mold as well. And, and how does that affect my son? And then the same thing I found with other people that are now reporting to me because I, I deal with various people that have toxic mold. Um, they have mold rage, anxiety, depression, um, all the same symptoms that these other people have. Some are losing their mind, meaning their memories. Um, so it's kind of good. It's interesting. And then I study dementia and Alzheimer's, which I told you all the studies are finding mold within their brains. So it's something to definitely look at, you know, and so what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, so certainly mold has been around a lot longer than we have. I mean, I suppose in the early earth, the earliest forms of life that were fighting against each other were the, was the, like the empire of mold and the empire of bacteria. I mean, and hence, you know, the effect of penicillin on bacteria <laughs> that uh, you know that uh, so these two were fighting and somehow um, uh, uh, mammals and and all of us lots of sort of somehow managed to to uh, make our way in the midst of that but I suppose mold isn't it's not entirely negative is it because it, it it's involved I've been reading about it's involved in the communication of trees you know, trees communicate with one another under the ground and they're using molds in some sure. way some sort of symbiotic um, relationship there. Uh, so it's I believe always, we're the same. Yeah, I believe we're the yeah. same. So it's not always completely negative. I suppose it's just the, the way these things are just trying to survive like we are trying to reproduce. Well, sure. again, we talk about viruses, you know, what the hell's that? You know? uh, have you? Yeah, some have people you, are saying that even viruses may have had some useful way of uh, contributing to evolution. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. You know, I, I believe that, you know, there's a, a symbiotic um, type of relationship that we could have or, or plants and, and the, the earth. And then there's also a parasitic, which we also could prove. So so both. Yeah, there's definitely beneficial. And I, I believe that um, it's how we live, um, interestingly, that determines our relationship with our environment. You know, and I, I contend that's the same thing with the fungi, because 
you know, we learn through biology that when we die, we decay and, and fungi is actually what eats us. Um, and it's interesting that it, it, they make up, you know, a lot of our biology as well. So I, I would contend that we have that type of relationship um, as well with our environment. Have you found anything similar traits with the people that have dementia? Um, you know, there's a saying, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. You mentioned that with people, they're, you know, you're retraining them to think and use their mind, go in with themselves, know thyself, um, to learn again and to, to live, to basically to keep rotating and moving forward, um, as opposed to standing stagnant and getting taken over by mold. Well, I think that, <laughs> yeah, oh, I've got various thoughts about that. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about the lifestyle that people are generally encouraged to in capitalist society of um, going to the same place and doing the same job for years and years and years and, and then going home and sit in front of the telly and just watch the telly for the evening and then you go back to work again. Um, that repetitive thing of um, just no stimulation, no real uh, passion for life or anything. It reminds me of the song by, wonderful song by Frank Zappa, um, I Am The Slime. Um, oozing out of your TV set, <laughs> uh, you know, it could be that the mold is, is sort of yeah, the slime, right? <laughs> societal, uh, and again, you think of the the archons are not not wanting people to fully express themselves, not wanting them to, uh, to realise their spiritual uh, possibilities and destiny, and you know, just keeping people uh, to to be very passive, and uh, and I think that is. Part of it, you know, that the also is stimulating, keeping your mind active is very important. And uh, there's a lot of research about that. I think there's a there's a thing called posit science. I don't know if you come across that, but, but they developing um, uh, programs. It was almost like computer games, but they're designed to, to help develop or, 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 you know, help the brain to keep going. So it does on all these all these um, games that you can play online and uh, they, they're designed to, to help stimulate and keep keep the um, synapses uh, buzzing about and <laughs> I think that's very important as well and that's why it's so important to stimulate people who have got dementia uh, otherwise it will just progress and people people lose their personalities and they lose their speech their power of speech after a while unless they are stimulated as I was talking with a woman, there's a woman um, called Penny Garner, whose teachings are in a book called Contented Dementia. And I spoke to her for an hour and a half because I was sharing her ideas about, about dementia and how to help. And she was saying in this place where they use her ideas, nobody loses their speech. And I thought, like, wow, that's something because we kind of got used to the idea that dementia progresses and after a while people speak less and less. But she's saying that no, you know, if you stimulate people sufficiently, it, like you say, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Just the same as if you don't walk about, you can, you know, get end up being stuck in the chair or the bed sure. and you can't move about. Same way, if you don't stimulate the speech and the brain and the person, the very personality shrinks away and uh, becomes more impoverished and dies. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite important. It's an important work. And I'll, I'll put that across to the carers. And, you know, yeah. Please do, don't, don't see this as an import. You know, you say you're looking after the person, making sure they're, they're eat enough and make sure they're clean and they're, they're, they're not physically damaged. But also, you know, keep the personality alive as well, because that's so important. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, you can look after someone for years and years, but if they're not really alive, it's not. It's so this, <laughs> this must, Monty, this, if, if what we're talking about it, it sounds like it's, if these are not natural laws, nature's laws that if we don't abide by as humans, we're going to have these things happen to us, whether they're, they're various illnesses, dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's, it's as if, you know, these are laws because the people that are instituting these laws, they're not having these same problems per se. They're not losing their mind. They're not losing it to where, you know, they can't walk anymore and they're in a wheelchair when they're 70 or they're 80 or they got to use a, a mobile scooter because they didn't use it. And then what's interesting, too, is that, you know, it's not rocket science. You know, I know a lot of people, 
you know, they may say they don't know it, but they do. A lot of people do know better that they should take a walk, they should exercise, they should use their mind, they should read, they should um, stimulate a little bit, but they there's something driving them not to, um, per se, and then they need someone, per se, like you to step in and intervene to to almost force it so they don't forget to, to wash a shower and to, to remember to do things. It's as if there's some other force which I'm saying possibly underlying that's controlling their central nervous system or these chemicals to make them want to die, almost like nihilism. Um, and again, this could be the extreme um, side, could be an addict, a drug addict, a meth addict, an alcoholic that keeps doing the same thing that's killing him, um, to the same thing to a person sitting on the chair, not using their mind, eating food, um, you know, and not using their legs, they're, you know, and they get diabetes and then they got to use a scooter and then all of a sudden they're losing their mind and all this thousands of dollars of care. And then people such as yourself got to take care of them. Um, and again, I'm not saying anything bad about that. I'm just trying to understand are the archons some type of hive mind force taking them to the grave quicker, um, possibly that is controlling them because they're not exercising the natural laws of being human and using their mind and and motion yeah i suppose well what that makes reminds me of the the uh, rudolf steiner idea that the the, the uh, arimanic uh, so you, you talk about the luciferic which is the very very active sort of um, creative side of things which if it's out of control it goes a bit manic is it's just sure. <laughs> yeah you burn out right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all over, a bit like my, my my poor friend who wanted to save the the uh, universe. But um, or else the Iranic is the more depressive, more more enclosed, more sort of slow, heavy, gravid <laughs> kind of dark <laughs> thing that uh, the, yeah. the sort of the greyness. I and mean, we all know about greyness in Britain. It's, 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 it's been very uh, awry manic these last few days in the middle of the summer, what should be. Uh, <laughs> so it does make you wonder about, you know, the, the sort of um, negative demiurge imagery, <laughs> and, uh, uh, sort of somebody, somebody brute. I, I think I put this in my book. There was a bit about um, imagining climates, inner climates, as if you were... If, as if you as a being, if you had a depressive climate, you could have beings who were living in your climate who were suffering and so having, having suffering from uh, uh, floods and, um, and endless gloom and clouds. Or, or if you were angry, there would be like earthquakes and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, tsunamis and stuff going on. And so please, you know, be, try to moderate your inner climate because you don't know what effect it might be having somewhere. I mean, it's a fantasy, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it's interesting because I believe that we do affect, you know, our surroundings and our energy and, and you know, science. There's this big thing um, called magnetism and esotericism and, and occultism, mesmerism. I actually believe that entertainers, um, magicians, uh, musicians, um, are a form of that when, you know, they have this music and they, they're they standing on a stage and they're kind of mesmerizing the crowd who's there and they're magnetized, of course, as I had mentioned, either by the ideas, the, the movement, the organization or or the music, you know, and, and we all go there for that type of thing. And it's it's just type of thing that's, that's really interesting that we're like magnets um, as well. Um, yeah, that's, and, that was, um, I think, the Sufi, I think the Sufi teacher, um, Omar Ali Shah, said, like attracts like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, you try to be the, the like that you want to attract. What do you want to attract? You know, be like that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and I feel that's part of what, what Gnosis is and, and Gnosticism, the intellectual type of, of path of knowing thyself and, of course, also knowing the world. And I, I believe science plays a part in that knowing thyself if I don't know um, my how the brain works or how the body and you know what chakras are oh those are my glands and this is how they work and there's actually a lot of science that other I'd say little Gnostics in their little areas that they've worked in have really um, expanded upon that our ancestors would just be like 
in heaven to have this type of, of knowledge. And, and that's what I kind of like doing is, you know, I like going to the ancient mysteries, um, the ancient Gnostics, but also going forward, you know, with my path and, and trying to kind of tie it all together. And then also, you know, the, the Demiurge and the Archons, what, what's that mean? What are they talking about? And that's why I keep tying to this because, you know, there's scientists like Rupert Sheldrick and his son, I think it's Merlin Sheldrick that, that talk about uh, the hive mind of the, the universe and it's all tied to fungi. And fungi, they're saying that we actually spawn from, as you had mentioned, you know, somehow we, we came to be who we, who we are. Um, so I, I believe that through time and through these ancient mysteries back from the Delphic oracles to the philosophies of Plato, why do we hold all these different mysteries and the, these philosophies and then it turns into religion, you know, and all these Abrahamic religions that are kind of all saying the same message. Of course, they all fight one another, whatever, but the underlying message is, you know, love thy neighbor, love one another, you know, in the end, you know, there's there's all this killing and stuff happening in between, but it's all kind of the same message, you know, don't sin. If we look at, say, Christianity and the sins, Monty, they're like sins are like kind of how you keep healthy, right? You, gluttony, slothness, all these different things, right? All, of, all those things that we are prone to as a result of our evolution. You know, evolutionary psychology explains why we crave sugar and uh, salt and uh, fat because yep. they were rare at then. You know, it was good for us to look for those things in in the early, and now they're abundant. They're everywhere, and it, which, which, <laughs> it's not so good. Not so good, yeah, and especially when you have too much sugar, you know, and that's when you'll have like fungi start growing within your gut, you know, and and have issues as well. So, and again, that's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the the left and the the right brain. Um, Ian McGill McGillchrist, um, he had written I, what is it, the emissary and the master um, and his emissary, master and his emissary. Yeah, um, great book. And uh, I haven't had the chance to interview him. I want to interview him in the in the next oh, coming months. But um, yeah, tell us what you you think about that. And then also, uh, you had mentioned, you know, for example, the um, frontal lobe being affected, the emotions in some dementia patients. Is there any type of the brain that's affected more than one or the other? And then also, of course, talk about the the left and the right brain research and and what what else you'd like to talk about. Yeah, well, I suppose with dementia, it, it can affect any part of the brain. So that is one of the things you bear in mind when you're working with people is to when you're observing them, you can tell sometimes, um, for example, if someone's speech is messed up, then you know there's something happened on the left side, uh, possibly by a stroke or, the, or also slower damage. Because um, some people, we find some people with dementia are quite articulate and they're fine, they can use language and others, it's all kind of broken up and they're trying to say something and often they know what they want to say and it comes out wrong. Yeah, so different, like, and then like you say, the frontal lobe, um, if that's affected, it, it, it makes it more difficult for the person to regulate emotion. Uh, so it's all different parts, but I suppose what all this comes down to, the most exciting thing about being, or one of the most exciting things about being alive now, is that we're able to look at people's brains while they're still alive, uh, which we couldn't do, you know, in the last century. The last century, basically, if, well, maybe towards the end of the last century could, but for most of that time, the only way you knew about someone's brain was to open them up after they died and see if they had a hole in it somewhere, or if it had shrunk or whatever. Whereas now a person can lie in the machine and you can look in and you can see what, what's going on. And that's, that's a really exciting uh, thing because, uh, like you say, the ancients, although they had incredible systems of of uh, sophisticated systems of psychology and so on, they didn't have access to 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 this information that we now have. So we now have the possibility of putting together this new information together with the ancient information. And I was thinking in terms of like. We could develop a new type of yoga, perhaps, where where you're actually, you know, you think of the chakras in the, the body, but here you could actually meditate on parts of the brain. Or you could actually look, you know, inside your own brain at the part and meditate on that part to augment its function or to reduce its function or just to see what happens. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's a very exciting sort of possibility. Uh, so I think, I think it was Jung who said that the Gnostics were the original psychologists. Um, and uh, they did have, I think that some of them did wonder and speculate about the brain. I'm sure I read somewhere about the meninges, you know, and the, the flow of cerebral spinal fluid being likened to the rivers in Eden in, in certain writings. And then we have the, the cerebellum at the back of the brain, which is very important to musicians because it's where you store all your your memory for how to play and how to fine tune those playings and timings and, and emotions when you're playing. And there's a structure in there which is called the, the arbor vitae, so the, the tree of life. So you think, well, why do they call it that? I mean, did they just see the structure and think, oh, that's pretty, we'll call it the tree of life? Or was there something esoteric there. Maybe they believed that you could draw upon something in the uh, cerebellum that would enhance uh, psychic possibilities. I don't know. You know, I'm just speculating there. Yeah. And I think there is that connection. I think before the, the ancient six tended perhaps to towards uh, rejecting the body and seeing the body, you know, the body and as, as its matter and stuff and it dies and decays. They tend to think, oh, no, only spirit, spirit matter, spirit, you know, the body. Whereas now I think, you know, we can put, put things together more uh, in the way that other spiritual systems such as Taoism or Shinto, uh, yoga, have a more integrated concept, a more positive idea that the body itself can be spiritual. Uh, the body itself thinks and feels, you know, and integrating the, the head, heart and the gut. And all of that, you know, there's there's that possibility now that we have. It's good we got something. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You, you you talk about the cerebellum and that being tied to the the music. And it's interesting is that you know what, what I find with a musician is they get of course more and more accustomed to playing music. It's almost as if it's effortless. The the mind to the the finger. It's it's like this body, this this clay body, whatever, is just like it's a comes a machine. Do you know what the cerebellum might be connected to? Is that connected to our vagus nerve or anything? Um, do you know any of the chakras or what it might be um, related to? It's in the back of our brain, right? The yeah. cerebellum? Well, certainly to the motor system. So the, the motor systems. That move. move okay. So that would be our body pr primarily. Our, okay. So it's particularly related to fine movements. Sure. I, mean, I, re I rely on it a lot. I'm a terribly, I'm terribly lazy about practicing. I hardly ever practice. I mean, probably if I did practice more, I'd be absolutely, you know, I'd probably be like Keith Jarrett or something. But uh, unfortunately, well, certainly during lockdown, I've not been very encouraged to play much. Yeah. So I'm hoping that when the gigs come again, I'll still be able to do it. And there I'll be relying on this cerebellum, you know, this what they call muscle memory. But it's it's really uh, in there as well. So well, it's yeah, so that... very connected to the motor system. But also, like you say, the vagus nerve to the to the heart, to the emotions, the heart and the gut as well, as it, it sort of regulates how the emotion is expressed uh, in the music, in the timing of it, in the nuances. Uh, of it and all that is the cerebellum is really important for all of that wow that's that's some cool stuff i am um, really really interested and fascinated by that you know and, and i i assume it's it's with everything right with with practice comes technique and and comes expertise um i mean that the same could be everybody's an expert at driving right after a while you could almost drive and not even we become automatons you know we're just like it just becomes really easy and and yeah, i see yeah. the same thing of course with musicians and when you're practicing all the time, right, it, it becomes easier, right? Oh yeah, especially, <laughs> I mean, you should, especially when you're young, when the brain is developing the most. Yeah, so let's the talk about, the... yeah, so can people become automatons, Mani? Meaning unknowingly, meaning they practice the same thing, i.e. go to work, Yeah. automaton, come home, turn on telly, they feed into brain what to think, go to sleep, go poop, go pee, auto, <laughs> right? So yeah. possibly, you know, like the um, philosophers have said, there's people who sleep, um, meaning they're almost as if they turned it off and, you know, they might've thought and had that lively thing, but something during their lives, they turned it off. 
that that fascination, that that aiming forward, the the constantly learning, where they become, you know, a behema, a beast, you know, type of thing. And and when I say beast, that's what our ancestors used to actually call um, those type of people. The Phoenicians called them behema. Um, the Greeks had called them therion. So there were people who were who were moving, but were not thinking. And again, I'm not talking derogatory because it's a sad thing when someone, of course, gets ill, they lose their mind. It could be any one of us. It could be our, our family members. But, you know, is that possibly what's happening? They're, 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 you don't use it, you lose it. Nature's telling you, you, you should have learned, you know, the, the archons are coming to take you to the undertaker. Well, it could also work the other way, couldn't it, as well? That, uh, um, I mean, all that's reminded me very much of Gurdjieff. And uh, Gurdjieff for the moon, thinking, right? Pe thinking of people as automatons mostly, and uh, I mean, if you, you study like uh, behaviorism and so on, that's very much the the, the uh, psychology of, of how to make people automatons, you know, <laughs> uh, just uh, give them rewards for things and, and punish them for others, and then you can, can you know make them behave in a certain way. But Gurdjieff, I mean, he's very interested. I mean, he was the one who said we had we were three brained beings. So he's kind of anticipating this head, heart, gut kind of intelligence thing and talk about how you can integrate those three or you can have them in opposition to one another. You can say, oh, my heart isn't in it, so you can't get it done or I haven't got the guts. You know, if you've got the lineup, you've got the guts, you your heart's in it and you've got the intelligence and the creativity, then there's almost nothing you can't do. <laughs> you know, whereas he was saying man cannot do so. It's, it's almost with Gurdjieff, it's almost like going back to basics, you know, the people, are you present? Well, of course I'm present. I'm in the room. I'm here. Yeah, but are you really present? Or is your mind present? Is your heart present? Is your gut present? You know, are you somewhere else? When you're watching the telly, are you present? When you work, are you present? I, I remember bringing this up at work in our, in our teachings. I called it um, sleep working. You know, that if you could, if you did go into this automaton thing, like you're saying when you're driving, um, if you, you can do that at work and then you'll treat people as objects. If you're a carer, you'll treat a person as an object to be cared for. Uh, and there was an object, there was an example of this uh, when the, <clears throat> the inspectors came to our home, the um, nursing home, the last time. Apparently, um, you know, someone needed weighing, you know, it's, it's important to weigh people because you can see whether they're, you know, whether they're benefiting from the food and they're not getting underweight or overweight. Uh, anyway, they, they weighed this person in the, in, the, in, the, in the lounge in front of everybody and shouted out, oh, he's this much. We th Hang on, that's like a sack of potatoes, isn't it? That's not a person, that's a sack of potatoes. <laughs> you know, you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sleep working. You know, you, you're on the task, you're getting things done and you're getting the do dopamine buzz from getting things done. But you're not, you know, your heart's not there. You're, you're, you know, you're not uh, feeling the person as a person. <laughs> yeah. And, and our world is built like that, Monty, kind of if we think about it. Right. It, it's all, you know, I'm a I own my own business and I've owned several businesses and I've, I've had it to where I, I tried to scale and and you know, make as much as I can because I, I wanted to have a retirement and get a house, so I thought. And then I, I realized what I was becoming as I was doing that. Um, I was forced to, to stand in line and to do things that I wasn't happy with morally and ethically, um, personally. And then I, I realized that I, it's almost better as if I just do the work myself rather than I have my employees slash slaves doing it for me while I sit and, and scale the business and treat them as automatons because you kind of you have to almost as you scale um, i.e. Amazon all these big companies they act like they're you know these social movements where uh, they're actually I'm an, Amazon, I'm an Amazon author unfortunately sure I mean we all are right <laughs> that's, where you, that's where you can get the book from I'm sure. afraid I signed my I signed to, up for the, with in blood for the devil <laughs> <laughs> I am I mean yeah. We're, we're kind of forced to. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. kind of our, our world now. And, and talk. let's talk about, you know, before we go, I know you only have so much time. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your book. Um, tell us about the, the title, what it's about, what inspired you to write it. Oh, OK. Well, this goes back to psychiatry as well, because it, it how it starts is that um, when I was doing my training, I was I was in I was in a um, 
in a meeting, handover meeting, you know, every day you hand over from one set of nurses to the other. And we all huddled in this office full of smoke in those days because they're not, not very, it's back in what Robin Hitchcock calls the smoke age. So everyone <laughs> full of smoke. And this woman bursts into the office, a little bit like my friend with the, the uh, who just wanted to save the universe in a similar state of mind. And she says, there's going to be seven writers who are going to write a book on the eternal truth. And you're one of them. And she pointed right at me, you know, oh, OK. And because I've been reading lots of Jung and I was into all this uh, archetypal, what do you call, what's he called? Amplification. Yeah. I, I said, oh, seven evangelists this time. <laughs> And all the nurses going, Ivy, <laughs> you're not, you know, they, the teaching was in then don't, don't um, reinforce the delusions. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just playing with it, you know, I'm just going with it. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I encourage people to go with the, with, you know, with people with dementia, it's very important to go with them and to, to see where they're at and to support them where they're at. But anyway, this woman, you know, she said, yes, you've got it. And off she went. I never saw her again. Didn't even know her name. But years later, it came back to me and I thought, yeah, well, perhaps I should do, you know, go ahead, you know, thinking about the Gnostics, how they wrote their own speculative writings and creative writings and their own visions and so on. I thought, yeah, I should just have a go do this. I've, I've been absorbing loads and loads of books while I've been on tour as well as before when I was, when I was studying uh, for the for the nursing, I was reading the collective works of Jung, and I started looking at world religions um, texts, Zoroastrian texts, the Gnostic texts, uh, Buddhist uh, scriptures, all kinds of stuff. And then when I went on tour, I was, I was um, going through the book best bookshops around, you know. The, so I love touring the US because you know there were like Powell's books in uh, in. Uh, uh, Seattle and uh, you know the and, and uh, City Lights San Francisco love that bookshop. So I'd browse in there and I go, oh I have that and I have that and I have that. I'd read and read. So I just allowed all this to kind of ferment in my mind and I had a little book by the side of the bed, little purple book. And every time I felt the urge, I would just go and write a load of stuff in it. And uh, it wasn't automatic writing exactly. I didn't feel you know kind of guided or compelled by a force from outside or anything like that. But I was allowed, I was letting whatever came out come out. So it was a very much a free association stream of consciousness, you know, a bit like I suppose like the surrealist used to do, just let it all come out and uh, write it like that. And then when I finished, I put it back and then next time I write a bit more. And uh, after a while I had a bit a body of, of stuff and uh, I'd forgotten about it for a while. And uh, read just found it. Oh yeah, this and uh, I'd since got friendly with um, Andrew Philip Smith, who brought brought out the the Gnostic magazine. I uh, got friendly with him as a result of there was a a, a review in there of um, the previous uh, drummer of the Dan Rats gave his opinion in search of the Holy Grail. And uh, so there's a review of it. And I thought, oh, I'll, I think I should get in contact and say, well, actually, you know, I'm reading these uh, magazines and, and I'm in the band now. <laughs> you know? So we, we got friendly and uh, he came to some some gigs in uh, Dublin where he was living at the time. And uh, after a while, I found, you know, I found this text and I thought, oh, I'll send it to, to Andrew. He might be interested in this. And I sent it. I didn't think, you know, in terms of public publication or anything, uh, but uh, you just sent it to him and he said, oh, I think I'll uh, publish this. Oh, right. OK. Uh, so then we had to restructure it a bit because it, it had just come out exactly as is. It was just this big sprawl of text. Um, uh, so what he did was to to cut it up into, you know, sort of Oh, there's this bit and there's that bit and the other and trying to get a structure where it had a kind of kind of beginning, middle and end. Not exactly, but it, it had a structure that made some more sense rather than it just being in the chronological order I'd written it. And then I came up with some uh, some subtitles to help break it up and help focus the mind on each bit. And then some images that uh, I'd done some some artistic images as well uh, that I'd created to go with it. And uh, oh yeah, and that was the other thing. 
you know, the original title on the eternal truth. I think, yeah, that's that's doesn't sound very interesting. That's not going to, you know, people are not going to run out and buy that. <laughs> Sounds a bit dry, academic, maybe even even uh, theological. And so I suddenly thought, ah, yeah, let's call it the cosmic brain explodes. <laughs> and uh, that comes. I, I'm thankful to Captain Sensible for for that because he gave me. My, my first uh, email name was the Cosmic Brain. He came around and gave me that name. Uh, so, but the Cosmic Brain isn't isn't really my brain. <laughs> well, in a way, it's, it's it's kind of exploring um, the cosmic consciousness. You know, there's this sort of panpsychic ideas that you uh, know it does seem as if the universe is is alive and and intelligent in some way. But in what form or what relationship we could have to that form of intelligence, you know, how could it be? This is what the text is exploring in a very poetic and I would say musical way. I would say when you're reading it, don't get too bogged down in what does this mean? What does that mean? In that, you know, the left brain trying to decode uh, the thing too much, but allow it as to read it as if it's a piece of music. You know, a piece of or of um, instrumental music that is, where there's no lyrics. So let it, you know, just sort of let it go into the mind and and see what that feels like. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the way I would uh, would suggest it be read. Yeah, that's cool, and I agree with you. I believe that the the universe is made of that this cosmic consciousness and. You know, Plato had called it the, the the world of ideas, you know, and I, I believe that's how we're all magnetized to one another, i.e. why I'm interviewing you today, Monty. I mean, first it's, you know, listening to the music of the damned over all the years, and then here we are later, 20 years, 30 years, and it's the path of knowledge and, and gnosis and knowing thyself. And if you look at, you know, this cosmic consciousness and what you talk about and you know, writing this book, it's its everything you had learned through various teachers and, and books and ideas that somehow magnetized to you and meant something to you. And that became who you are today, Monty, along your path, you know, a Gnostic who, who is a man of knowledge, a, a psychiatrist who's helping people along their path that are starting to lose their brain and lose their mind. And then also helping others out there with your, your music, you know, and helping stimulate that other part of their brain Right. So it's as if you're this full guy working all the different parts of people's brains like a magician, Monty the magician, <laughs> but in a good way, in a good way. Um, right. So, but yeah, so when you said the, the yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the, the cosmic consciousness you, you've tapped into and, you know, writing this book, that's what you're you're relaying. And Captain Sensible gave you a, a good idea for the. Tell him I said hello um, from Southern California. He's a definitely a big fan of his. Um, I'm not one of those guys that, of course, you know, I'm old school punk rock guy. I don't, of course, idolize, but I, I have a lot of respect um, for you guys. And it is an honor to to interview you. Um, and it's um, just it's a kind of a dream kind of come true, to be honest to say. And and really to talk to you like a friend uh, about ideas and, and knowledge, you know, so it's awesome. And. And tell us before we go, what, what does, you know, Gnosticism mean to you and what advice can you give to other people out there um, as they start their pass on, you know, Gnosis or whatever, whatever they might want to call it? Well, I suppose I haven't meant, we haven't mentioned William Blake yet, have we? But uh, there's a lot in William Blake that is very Gnostic. And uh, so I think of him very much when he said, um, I must, um, I must forge my own mythology or be or be imprisoned by another man's and uh, I mean it's very easy to be imprisoned by other uh, other people's philosophies belief systems I mean all the obviously all the, the very rigid dogmatic religious structures that exist that will take away all your personal responsibilities so I mean, you just but you just think feel and behave like this and you will get the reward if you don't you know what will happen. Sure. Um, so I mean, someone like someone like William Blake is oh well, no, I'm going my own way. I'm I'm going exploring. I'm not going on the broad path. I'm going on the narrow path. 
um, up the mountain and see what's up there. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think that's the thing about the Gnostics is that, that you know, what's the point of being an individual, of having, uh, of having a unique uh, personality and possibility if you don't use it? What's the point of having an internet if you don't use it or a, or a gut if you don't use it? You know, all these things have been given to us presumably by you know, the, the, the original parent of the original source. So why would, would God want us to be, well, we said automatons, you know, uh, sheep they use in the Bible, but it's more like robots, isn't it? You know, why, yep. why would he want that? Uh, it doesn't make sense. And uh, the, the ancient Gnostics and William Blake criticised the Old Testament image of God. Is a is a right grumpy old person, you know, not, <laughs> with with hang-ups. You know, I am a jealous god. I mean, we don't usually uh, we don't usually celebrate jealousy as being a particularly positive quality. It's like saying I'm insecure. Well, you can say that, you know, I'm insecure. I need help. But God doesn't say that, does he? I mean, if he does, then we're really in trouble. You know, <laughs> uh, I did. I did once, oh gosh, I, I, I'm very reverent. I remember coming up with this idea that maybe God had dementia and he'd been around so long for such a <laughs> long time and he couldn't remember why everything, how it all worked and why it was here. And, oh, sorry, I can't, oh, God, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that maybe Blake missed out on with Eurism, you know, he could have, could have had him in a wheelchair or something. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that. I suppose that's the thing about the Gnostics that there there is a certain spiritual courage, isn't there? Because it, the the path is uncertain. You don't know where it's going to lead. You don't know whether you're even in the right. Sometimes you find yourself doing stuff uh, that seems to fit together, and yet you know there is conflict within you. Uh, and then you find you you're particularly very aware of your uh, faults. And if you're when you're being hypocritical and you say, "Oh, I believe in this," and yet I do that, uh, you know, all this conflict about being a human being and being able to be a spiritual person at the same time, without, as I say, just slavishly following dogma rules. So, uh, we're getting very used to following rules a little too much, perhaps at the moment. Uh, we have to watch it that they, they don't once the bloody COVID is gone, that they don't keep us uh, straight jacketed and muzzled in in, the, in that because they could use, I'm not, I don't go along with a lot of the conspiracy theories, I think, part, partly because I'd just despair if I did, <laughs> you know, sure. I want to jump, jump out the window if it's that bad, you know, Yeah. But, but I don't think it's that bad, but we're going to be aware at the same time that you know, the governments and the powers that be are going to get used to having more power over us than they did before. And they are going to get used to uh, the idea of controlling us by means of fear or social uh, pressure. So, you know, one day we're going to have to throw these shackles off. One day we're going to have to live again. We can't live like this much longer. You know, it just can't go on. Uh, yeah. Just got to use our intelligence and, and see the way through. And uh, yeah. so I think I think that's very much the Gnostic path, as you say, know yourself, be yourself, be true to yourself uh, and, uh, you know, keep on on the path. That's great advice, Monty. It's been a, a great honor to uh, interview you today. And, and where can people find your great work? Where can we direct them to? OK, well, I'd, I'd like to also mention other other things I've got. On the yeah, concert. please do. Please do. So the book itself, as I said, I sold my soul to Amazon. <laughs> Amazon <laughs> author. Oh, a very good company they are too. Uh, I just wish they treat their uh, their, uh, their employees, yeah, better. Uh, but but yeah, they, 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 so they've got a nice. Uh, there's a nice uh, author page there. I put some stuff on there. I put some artwork and thing and things on there too. So uh, there's the Amazon page. There's uh, I'm putting up a whole lot bunch of stuff up on YouTube. A lot of my music and musical experiments, uh, including playing the the uh, railway bridge just down the road there, because <laughs> uh, it has particularly nice um, sounds. The the railings on the side of the bridge, and the, anyway, you can have a look at that. Uh, nice. And then mo most importantly, of course, my Bandcamp, because <laughs> <laughs> that's where you can buy my music. Uh, <laughs> 
but I, I think I have probably one of the most eclectic collection of music on there imaginable. I mean, it, there's psychedelic stuff, there's punk stuff, there's um, satirical uh, comedy cabaret stuff, there's jazz, there's a lot of jazz, so sort of, some of it's free jazz, some of it are compositions, uh, just all kind all kinds of things, you know, from the sublime, you know, the beautiful meditative stuff that will will bliss you out and help you connect with the with the, the with the pleroma, uh, to the very very ridiculous, extremely mad stuff <laughs> that I just recently put up with my 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 friend Martin Pottle, who uh, we've got a I've got one on there called the Corpse Organ Favourites, <laughs> cool. which, uh, which is really bad. I mean, it, it includes, oh, we talk about American punk, it includes a track dedicated to uh, Geno Biafra because it was inspired by his version of They're Coming to Take Me Away, ha ha he, which he mm -hmm. did with Lard. And uh, my friend Martin heard this and he went, all right, I'm going to do this song called The Staring Song. I'll soon be staring at everyone. Staring <laughs> can be fun. <laughs> so there's that. So cool. there's something for everybody there. I mean, just listen to it, and if you like something, please buy it. Because at the moment, I am very, I have not very much income at all. Um, I've had some problems at work since the COVID got into the nursing home. Just after Christmas, I got far less shifts. They didn't need so many nurses, you see, because there were less people to look after. So I've had very little nursing work and obviously no gigs, no, not neither damn gigs nor, you know, solo gigs here. So <laughs> nothing. So this is my only source of income. We oh, buy the man. book and my music and uh, otherwise sure. it will be spare change. Spare <laughs> change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here's, well, on, on here's what I said. Monty, I have I have a good idea for you and, and I believe that you would you would do really well. You're you're a wealth of knowledge. Um, also, you're a great musician. Um, you've been doing music for, you know, several decades. Uh, there's a lot of people that follow you. I, I suggest that you you get more active as far as like this on a video and possibly a podcast. Um, I believe people would be interested in listening to you. You would get an immediate following and then you start a, a Patreon type of account or a PayPal and people kind of join it. So it's it's like the Miguel kind of format. And that's how you know, guys like Miguel and other podcasts, they, they like give the first hour for free in the next hour. And you could do that with music. You could do live performances, stuff like that. I, I believe you could make, you know, three to 4,000 US dollars easily, um, you know, transfer that into pounds to, to help supplement. Um, so I would suggest, and, and you're a great talker, um, your brain still works very well, right? <laughs> so that's a good thing. No. <laughs> yeah, you got a wealth of gnosis and knowledge to share to the world, and you got many years left. So think about it, and I, I think you would do great. And if you need help, um, I would be happy to help you. I've been doing this for for ten years, and um, I could get you up and running in a day or two. So right, okay. Well, yeah. Any ideas? Of, I mean, at the moment, as I say, I'm building up the the YouTube channel, but I've got about I don't know about thirty. 36 uh, people <laughs> so far is yeah it's <laughs> yeah it's just, it's an, what they call it. there's so many people trying to get people's attention you mm -hmm. know so there's little things that you have to do they're not nefarious um, or mind control but you got to break through the mind control to say hey, Monty come here sign up uh, put an email if you like my work and then you constantly put yourself out there because people have such a short attention span but in any event enough talk we'll, we'll talk maybe off camera about that stuff and um it was really great again interviewing you today monty and I, I wish you the best in all you do well one thank you very much i want just last link thing if, sure. if anybody reads the book and they enjoy it uh it'd be help me if they if they wrote a little review you can put them on on uh, on the amazon or, or elsewhere but just a little review to say oh i like this book and you know that would really help that would be good Yes, yes. Reviews help. You know, anything you can do to subscribe to Monty's channel, go to his website yeah. if you, you found this helpful. And then also his music, um, support him in any, any way you can. And again, I appreciate you, Monty, everything that you've done. And I, I wish you the best. Great. Well, thank you. It's been enjoyable. It's been good. You're welcome. Take care, man. Bye. Yeah, you too.